are in the power of the tongue. And uh, whether we accept that or not, at first, like I said two weeks ago when I first read it, I actually didn't believe it until it was really written in the scripture. Now, life can come from the words that you say, and death can come from the words that you say. So let's come to the Lord and pray for our time this morning. Lord, we ask that you be the one to speak in our hearts. Holy Spirit, come and teach us so we can understand. We thank you, Lord, for your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. <clears throat> uh, we will, again, uh, for those in, online, if you want to catch on the second service, we now have a second service at 2.30, and you will be receiving the same message that is preached in the morning. All right. Power of words. The amazing facts about words. There are some things that I've read in the scripture that I couldn't believe. Actually, if you read the whole Proverbs, it has only three themes, uh, money, morality, and mouth. And every time you read the book of Proverbs, it just deals with all of those three, three topics. And you find out so many scripture speaking about our, our mouth and our words. And uh, every time you release words, you're either releasing death or life in your life. Now, this is the third of the series in the, in the message that I'm preaching, and uh, I hope you won't, uh, you know, uh, you would still continue to like me after, after hearing all these messages, because it's really a very convicting series, but there's a lot of things that you can learn and life can flow out of it. Today, I will just speak on facts, amazing facts about the words or the tongue. Hey, if you read James chapter 3... If you make a study of James, you'll find out James chapter 3 has the longest discourse about words. And let me start with James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Now, you don't read this when you're recruiting teachers in the academy, right? Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Because, you, of course, you're using your mouth more often than the regular person. But we all stumble in many ways. Now, listen. Watch carefully. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Also, able also to bridle the whole body. Now, that's amazing. That's an amazing statement. A person who doesn't stumble in his words, he is perfect. Anybody here find a perfect person? <laughs> yes, yeah, so all of us stumble in our words. That goes to say it is assumed every one of us stumble in our words. Now, think about the lust of the flesh or, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, whether it's uncontrolled appetite or sexual lust or any part of your body. Now, think about that or whether you lack of sleep or exercise. Now, this is amazing. If you can fix your tongue, you can fix your body. That's what it's saying. I mean, it's saying if you can actually bridle your tongue, you become perfect. Now, I'm going to give you four amazing facts, quoting James chapter 3, and I want you to just go ahead and, and confirm it in your hearts if it's true or not, because I believe this, num, these four things are so, so real and so relevant to all, all of us. Number one, <clears throat> the tongue <clears throat> is disproportionately, disproportionately powerful. Now, the big word here in this, in this point is the word disproportionately you know, again, I could say the tongue is powerful. It's not an amazing fact. The amazing fact is it's disproportionately powerful. In verse, in chapter uh, 3, James chapter 3, verse 3 to 5, it says, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. In other words, again, fix your tongue, fix your body. Uh, it says, then it goes, look at the ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds. Now, thinking of storms. They are turned by a very small rudder, whether the pilot, whether, where, whatever, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a small member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Now, in all the points that I'm going to make, in the four points I'm going to make, I'm going to be emphasizing on the adverb. You know, if you have studied English, you know what an adverb is, right? Adverb qualifies a verb, right? Or it describes a verb, or at times also describes an adjective. In this point, powerful is the adjective. The adverb is disproportionately. 
sounds very big, but in all the facts I'm going to mention, the, the, the adverb is really the most important un point to understand. And it's usually, follow, it's usually spelled with the last two letters, L-Y. So the tongue is disproportionately powerful. Not just powerful, but disproportionately. And here's the point. If the tongue is powerful, we can accept that when we un try to understand it is so small and yet it can release or unleash tremendous power. Three examples mentioned here, illustration number one, a bit in a horse's mouth. Now, you, I don't know what the bit is, but I, I have not worked with horses. No, I barely ride a horse, I think once in my lifetime. And, uh, but I've seen and read uh, movies, uh, read stories and movies about horses. And you, you can study that a bit is a very small piece of metal. And it controls in the, dire uh, the, the strength and the direction of usually a 1,000 to 1,200, 1,200 a pound horse, animal. And this piece of metal controls their strength and their direction. Now think about it. Our tongue can control our strength and our direction. Our tongue can control our strength and our direction. You know, some people use this psychological test. They call it the strength finders test. And, uh, and that's really good if you take it. But, you know, you can dis discover all your strength. But if you can't control your tongue, it won't help you. That's what the Bible is saying. A bit in a horse's mouth. Because you, were able to because you won't be able to direct all your strength and your direction in the right way. So if, uh, you know, if you understand how a bit is so, is so, so small and it can control a powerful horse, in other words, it's your body will become wild and lost direction if you cannot control the words that you say. Now watch carefully this very powerful verse as I start to understand in James chapter 1 verse 26. If any one of you thinks he is religious, the term religious there is the Greek, it's a wonderful Greek term, but it really translates into serving God. So if any one of you serves God, it doesn't mean tradition or rituals, but it means the religious there really means if any one of you serves God, right? If anyone you thinks he is religious or serving God and does not bridle his tongue, listen, but deceives his own heart, this one's service to God is useless. Again, you know, it speaks of the power of words. Now, even though you're serving God, you know, you might volunteer in other work, you might serve in, in the church or outside the church, or you might serve God in your own way. But if you are not able to control or bridle your tongue, your service is useless. So if anyone of us would like to just go ahead and give God a, you know, a wonderful service and go in missions or go whatever you want to do, but if you're not able to bridle your tongue, your service is useless. You know, there's one uh, terrible uh, survey in America that the number two in the survey, the, the top uh, second highest wife beater in America or beats their wife are ministers. And I couldn't understand it, you know. And God is saying, you know, if you, if you serve God and then you go home and, and beat your wife with your words, then your service, whatever it is, is useless. Amen? Amen. So all the wives say amen. That's for you. <laughs> amen. <clears throat> Second thing is the rudder of a ship. Again, disproportionately powerful. Think about ships and how large it is, you know. Uh, David, what, uh, Arlene's son, you know, would post pictures and how huge the ship is. And sometimes, you know, you need a, you can't just walk around it in, in one whole day. Uh, Abel and I have been in, you know, some of you have been some cruises. And Abel and I have been in a cruise on our 25th wedding anniversary. We'll probably repeat that on our 75th <laughs> or maybe on our, but it was, it was you know, uh, we just able to purchase. And I, I found out if you purchase a, a ticket on a cruise, the lower you go on the deck, the cheaper it is. The higher you go up, the more expensive. Of course, we went to the very lowest deck, you know. And the smaller uh, window you have, the cheaper the price of the, of, the, of the ticket is. We went to the Royal Caribbean ship, and, uh, you know, it, of course, it is, you know, we, it, was not, it was a medium-sized cruise ship. But it has 11 floors. 
and every floor has an activity. And then in one floor, it's, you know, eat all you can 24-7, you know. And people just, you know, just eat whatever they want to eat. But can you imagine such a huge ship, all controlled by a very small rudder? And if, if you talk to any captain of a ship, and if you ask him if he's in the middle of a storm, and he's, he's facing fierce winds, the ship must be positioned in such a way that is so important, or else if it's not positioned the right way, it can capsize in the midst of a storm. So do you realize that lives, people's lives are capsized because their tongue does not face them in the right direction? Because the tongue, which is supposed to be a rudder of the whole life, is not pointing them in the right direction. See, how, how important words are. It's so important that when you have a storm, you're able to say the right words. You're able to point your life in the right direction. Even when things are going smoothly. You know, I remember <clears throat> having a time with my, you know, one of my spiritual disciples who's an American missionary. He went to Puerto Galera and we had a sailboat. Took me on a sailboat. The, the water was very calm. There was nothing but his rudder broke. And so he had to fold the whole sailboat or else even in a good weather, you can be in danger of a shipwreck if you cannot, do not have a rudder. And so, so this is an amazing thing to me. This is, just take a look at your life. Take a look at your course. Take a look at your direction in life. Words, your tongue can point you in the right direction. Or can cause you to be shipwrecked. How can that be? Such a powerful, small part of the body. Which brings me to the third and final illustration in the verse. is a spark, a little spark, and a huge forest fires. You know, I've seen pictures after math of forest fires. You know, you go, everything is green. You know, and then you go over a, uh, over a, uh, a little bit of a hill. And all of a sudden, you can see miles or acres or hectares and hectares of, of black stumps because of a forest fire. And uh, if you ask, you know, if you read the news, you'll find out it was simply caused by one person who's driving a car carelessly, carelessly <clears throat> turns off a butt of a cigarette and lights off a huge forest fire. Destroys the whole scenery, destroys every life and every form in that area. That's how the tongue can be. You know, even a small comment, a small statement from us can cause a huge forest fire. Can cause lives to be destroyed. And so, it's not just today, it's not just words that are spoken, but it's words posted on social media. Amen? And sometimes, it's harder to remove when it's posted on the internet. So, I, I, I think for all of us, you know, just, just in this generation... If we are going to speak words uh, that we know can actually affect or infect or, or you know, be a, a terrible impact on other people's lives, think twice. Especially if you're going to post it on social media, think twice. Because you can cause a forest fire, right? And that's what James is saying. It's disproportionately powerful. Brings me to the second fact. The second fact is the tongue is inherently powerful evil. That's what the Bible says. Now, James chapter 3, verse 6 says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it's set on fire by hell. In fact, verse 8, it says, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now, again, Look at the adverb. What is the adverb? Inherently. I can say the tongue is evil, but that's not the amazing fact. The amazing fact is the tongue is inherently evil. Okay? And we, we probably could say that we are born with an evil tongue. Or, you know, like you look at children. You don't need to teach children to be rude, but you don't need to teach them to say nice words. Right? It's like part of them. Or we can, we can say it in another way. The default setting on a tongue is to destroy and not to build. Unless you change the default setting, you reset your tongue, we're going to do more damage than good. Amen? You know, this is a great message. 
it's better than your amen. <clears throat> so, uh, I just, uh, just I don't, I actually didn't want to talk about this, but it's the only illustration I could get. Just think about when you were in high school, right? You know, uh, when terrible words were spoken to you, you know, uh, like the way you look or your height or your weight. Now, I don't, I hope some of you won't need to have some tissue <laughs> this morning, but I can tell you that whatever difference you had in your appearance in high school, you know, braces, glasses, overweight, uh, taller, and the, different from the most of the class, then you get all the blunt brunt of the, you know, the teasing and the ridicule, and you can say, wow, the tongue is inherently evil. You know, I don't know, believe me, when I was growing up, I was skinny. You know, Pastor Eric was skinnier than me. <laughs> In fact, I received so many jokes about being skinny. You know, you're so skinny when you turn sideways, you disappear. <laughs> you're so skinny when you turn sideways, you stick your, mouth, mouth, your tongue out, you're like a zipper. You don't understand those jokes. <laughs> you're so skinny, you look like a skeleton. No, and, and all of those jokes were just, were just there, you know, to just make people fun. But actually, my best friend, you know, went to be with the Lord. So I'm the worst joker in the world, you know. Uh, I'm going to tell, I'm going to talk to him when I get to heaven, you know. <laughs> because every time he makes a joke at me, it's just like, you know, sometimes you think it's just a joke. But then it goes deep into your heart, right? You never forget it, you know. Uh, he makes fun of me because of the color of my skin. And uh, he sometimes said, uh, uh, Jerry, you're so dark, I can not di can distinguish between your shadow and you. Oh, <laughs> no grabe. <laughs> and all of that kinds of things. You know, I remember uh, people make fun because, you know, everybody, of course, in the Philippines wants, wants to be white. When I got to the States, I found out myself that I'm, I'm whiter than some of their, some of their friends of mine. <coughs> I remember when I was, I don't know, I told this story a couple of years ago. I went to Atlanta, Georgia, and this is one of, one of the ways God just kind of tell me, you know, don't believe the jokes that you received in high school. I, I went to a, uh, I was the last one to board the plane because I was so late. As I was going through the plane, <clears throat> I see, you know, where my seat is, and I see this, as, you know, this young uh, black girl smiling at me. And uh, she was smiling at me from, you know, all the way from the very front. And I thought my zipper was open, you know. That, why is she smiling? But when I got there, before I sat down, she says, oh, uh, I really like your color. You're so handsome. That erased all the jokes in the high school. <laughs> but, yes, do you agree tongue is evil? The default setting is to destroy. And I, like I said last week, many times we say things we don't want to mean, but we the, old, the, the way, best way to get out of it is say, oh, I'm just joking, or you're too sensitive. But really, words can last. Amen? So be careful with your words. Number three, the tongue is humanly untamable. Again, the adverb is humanly. <clears throat> James chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, of creature of the sea is tamed, has been tamed by mankind. Now notice this word mankind in Greek, doesn't just speak about man. The word mankind there, Greek, it, it, it speaks of general, both male and female. So in Greek, you know, because if, you know, and then it goes on to say, but no man, no, that's, that's also referring to mankind, uh, can tame the tongue. Now I'm saying, I'm emphasizing mankind because when women hear this, no man can tame the tongue. Yeah, that's right, no man. <laughs> it also includes the women, all right? It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison, okay? Another one of saying no human can tame the tongue. Many times in the scripture when it says man, it uses a Greek word which really means the whole mankind, right? Uh, let me, let me t t say something about, you know, male, there's a male and there's a female. Both are persons, but the other one has a fee. Female. Sometimes uh, you need a little bit of uh, IQ when you listen to my jokes, you know. <clears throat> All right. Women have a feet. Come on, guys. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Let's go on. The point is, 
No human can tame the tongue. No human can tame the tongue. It's humanly untamable. That's the bad news. I tell you the good news. It's divinely tameable. That's the good news. No man, no humans can, human can tame the tongue, but God, who has the owner's manual, can tame it. Now, let me give you a, a passage in Scripture that God used to me, used with me when I was, you know, when I was starting to be a pastor. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I am not eloquent. You know, I have a problem with my tongue. Now, watch this. This is very encouraging. Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. You know what that, I interpreted that? Lord, I have a problem with my tongue. Before I got saved and after I got saved, before I met you and after I met you, nothing has changed. I still have that problem, Moses says. And then he went on to say, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. <clears throat> you know what that means? It means like, how many of you sometimes face the situation where before you have to say something, you have to think about it first, and, and you can't think it qu quick enough so before you can say it. And so sometimes, you know, your, your, your mind gets slower than your mouth, right? And I, I face that all the time, all the time. And so I had to pause for a while and think before I started to speak. Now, here's what God says in his own words. So the Lord, verse 11, for chapter, Exodus 4, 11. And so the Lord saw, said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, therefore, go. Here's the good news. And I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. <coughs> when the Lord first called me into the full-time ministry, that's my dilemma. I said, Lord, I don't think I can speak for an hour, for 30 minutes. And I don't know. Sometimes, you know, we have conversations with friends. After two or three minutes, I don't have anything else to say. Have you ever felt that? You're in a crowd. You're in you're, 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 you eat your friends. And you don't know what to say. And I am a very quiet person by nature. And so I said, Lord, this is definitely not my calling. But the Lord says to me, I will be with your mouth. And that was the greatest assurance I've had, you know. Uh, not only being able to know what to say, but to have the boldness to say it in front of people. You know, sometimes uh, I, I want to say something that might be controversial in the body of Christ, but I'm just going to assure you that our church is very firm on a firm doctrinal ground when we talk about this, that when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit, part of the Godhead. The first thing that the Holy Spirit did when he entered the people was to change their tongues. Now think about that. The only way you can change your tongue is to submit your tongue to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's humanly untamable. But, it's divinely tameable. Amen? So that's very powerful because then you know yourself. If God sends you, Lord, I don't know what to say. Lord, I'm not eloquent. Oh, come on. If, you, if I look at some of the, you know, my colleagues when we started the church, there's a lot more eloquent people than me to become a pastor of a church. You know, we have, I can count like four or five of them. Uh, was some of, one of them's not with us in the Lord. Others are in another country, but... Lord, why would you choose me? You know, and I'm the most quiet person in the group. You know, of course, I'm the most handsome, but <laughs> you all look so serious anyway. <clears throat> now, let me say this. Why is it so important to let the Holy Spirit control your tongue? Because uh, it says the tongue is set on fire by hell itself. That's, that's scripture. That, that's not me. That's the Bible. The tongue is set on fire by hell itself. You know something? Hell wants to occupy your mouth. That's a reality. And let me tell you something. People don't know this. Satan doesn't want to hurt you. No, he doesn't want to hurt you. You believe that? He wants to kill you. <laughs> Sometimes we think, oh, he's so merciful, and I'm down, and I have so many problems, he's not going to come and attack me. No, that's not true. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to kill you. 
Which brings me to the second fact, because you're not yet dead, means Satan hasn't gotten to you yet. <coughs> and so, <coughs> I'll give you a second, a second point, uh, a sidebar to that. Thank you, sweetheart. But Satan cannot hurt you even though he wants to. He has to ask permission from God. Said That's not only common sense, but that's scriptural. Because if he can hurt you, if he can touch you, you would have probably been dead today. You know what he's doing? He's trying to turn your mouth against yourself and let you kill yourself. That's what he's doing. He's trying to occupy your mouth to destroy your destiny, your marriage, your career, your future, your life, and everything about your, your destiny in the Lord. Every time you open your mouth or speak, you're either agreeing with God and life or you're agreeing with Satan and death. And that puts a lot of responsibility every time we open our mouth. That makes us think before we say something. And many times, we take a lot of, we, we don't take it, we take it too lightly. But that's the whole strategy of Satan. He wants to use your mouth to destroy yourself, destroy your ministry, destroy your career, destroy your job, destroy your relationships. And many times, he's successful. Big brings me to the fa fact number four. The tongue is contrastingly productive. Okay, again, take a look at the adverb, contrastingly. Contrastingly. James chapter 3 verse 9 says, With it we bless God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of God. Verse 10, Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, you can hear the you know, the, the burden of James saying this, My brethren, these things ought not to be. Verse 11, Thus a spring sent forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives and a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. Of course, those are uh, questions that, you know, uh, simply has one simple answer. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, again, notice the proverb. It's contrasting. I could say the tongue is productive, but that's not the amazing fact. The amazing fact is it is contrastingly productive. So what's so amazing about it is the tongue is evil, and if you're not, you know, if you're not uh, controlling your tongue, it will produce evil because it's inherently evil. The tongue is not tameable humanly, that James was saying, but it's divinely tameable. And then the tongue is productive, but it's contrastingly productive. You know, it can produce good or bad. You know what it's saying? Do you know nature can't even do what the tongue can do? You know what it's saying? Nature cannot even do what the tongue can do. Can a fig tree bear olives? No. Can apples, apple tree produce oranges? No. It can't. So it, nature can't do that. But the tongue can. But the tongue can. And here's what it's saying. It, the, the contrast of what it does, it's just far left and right. You know, with our tongue we bless God and with it we curse the people who are made in the image of God. Here, here's what happens sometimes. And sometimes I'm, I'm caught in this as well. You know, I, I'm not a perfect person, so I stumble with my tongue at times. Worship the Lord. Lord, I bless you. I praise you. But in a long, praise the Lord, he's not here. I hate him so much, you know. He's the worst gossip in the church. And I told everybody about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, Lord, have grace on this church. <laughs> Let me read you. Now, I'm, I'm going to close with the message translation, which is so clear. And again, this is a short message, but it cuts very deep. Listen to it carefully. Read the same passage in the message translation. <clears throat> now, if you don't have a message translation, I suggest you buy one or you get one in online. It's very, very good for reading. It says, don't be in any rush to become a teacher, my friends. Teaching is highly responsible work. Teachers are held to the strictest standards. And none of us is perfectly qualified. We get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouth. 
If you could find someone whose speech was perfect, true, perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in perfect control of life. Well, that disqualifies all of us, right? None of us is perfect. Therefore, I am absolutely sure this message will speak to you. A bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony into chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in the smoke with it. It's smoke right from the pit of hell. This is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. Their tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. Uh, with our tongues, we bless God, our Father. With the same tongues, we curse the very men and women He made in His image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. A spring doesn't gush fresh water on one day and brackish the next, does it? Apple trees don't bear strawberries, do they? Raspberry bushes don't bear apples, do they? You're not going to dip in a polluted mud hole and get a cup of clear, cool water, are you? It's very clear. It is very clear. It's contrastingly productive. But the tongue can produce a lot of good, productively good. You can bless your marriage with your tongue. You can bless your job with your tongue. You can bless your finances with your tongue. You can bless your health. You can bless your future with your tongue. The same way the tongue, the tongue can destroy, it can produce good fruit. That's the good news. Amen? And the good news is because God created the tongue, he created us, he can fix us. Amen? Uh, brings me to a story I remember many years ago. I've read about it. There was a car in a highway. The hood was up. person was trying to fix the car, suddenly broke, breaking down in the, in, the, in the side of the highway. Then a limousine, a stretch limousine parked right beside it. Out comes the driver, opens the door, and a guy who has a three-piece suit came out, you know, really looks like a million dollars. He goes up to the car to the person, what's wrong with your car? Uh, I can't make it start, the guy says, the driver says. Now, let me try to, try to, let me try to look at it. You know, I, I know a little bit about engines. So this guy in a three-piece suit come and tried to, fiddle on the car. And why don't you go back to the driver's seat and then start it when it's ready and, and, and let's see what happens. So this guy spends like five minutes fiddling on the car. And so why don't you start it? And the, the driver starts and it starts automatically. And it was, it was amazing. So, you know, put down the car and he puts out his white handkerchief, tries to wipe it, tries to go back to the stretch limousine. And this guy says, hey, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. Why did you help me? Can I pay you? You know, how come you, you would do this, you know? Well, you know, you know sir, my, my name is Henry Ford, right? Do you know Henry Ford? Okay. The one who invented the engine. And he says, and I can't stand it. I create, created the engine. I can't stand it. One of my creations is on the side of the road, couldn't run when it should be moving, and so I can fix it because I created it. How many of you, that's our father? How many of you know he can fix our tongue? How many of you make it come out the best kind of confession for our prayers, for our lives, when we allow the Holy Spirit to fix our tongue? Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We have, I can tell you, all of us, all of us, none except, no, no exception, all of us have released words that we know are bad and have been affecting other people. But I can tell you this, with the Holy Spirit, we can make things right and, of course, Make, th make things better because we can be productive, we can say the right words, and God would bless the people around us. Amen? Not only people around us, but us as well. Amen? Amen. I'm going to share a personal story, probably. I ask the worship team to come up on stage. <clears throat> Going full-time in the ministry was the hardest decision of my life. I can tell you, I can be, I have been... Uh, leader of the youth group, uh, you know, for like five years. And, uh, you know, we've been doing all kinds of crazy. We rented a student center and, 
And that's fine with me. I don't have to go full-time. But when the Lord called me to full-time, I had struggles, you know, thinking, Lord, how am I going to fulfill this calling? And uh, I can tell you right now from the bottom of my heart, it was because of my wife, Abel. She was the one who spoke words into my life that I'll never forget. You are a great husband. You are a good preacher. And even recently, you are a good, you are a great father. And she doesn't probably know this, but to be very honest, I discipled her, but she built my ministry with her own words in my life. And every one of you are blessed with every preaching that I make. It's because my wife, Abel, planted a tree that bear fruit that's now becoming a blessing to even other nations. Same thing we did with our boys. We spoke and blessed them with words. We know that words are cheap, some people think. But when you study the scripture and you let the Holy Spirit use your words, it becomes one of the most powerful, powerful weapon you'll ever have in raising your children, in raising up and speaking good things into your parents, in your relationships, and even in your own life. Now, later on in the future, I'll talk about confessing the right words. And that will be a powerful statement. You know, you say, oh, Pastor Jerome started this series all negative. Well, wait till next week. It's even more negative next week. But listen, we're learning something, aren't we? We're learning the weight of words that we speak. And we're learning to understand that the same weight is placed when we speak the right words. Encouraging words. Powerful words. Words that can direct the destinies of young kids. Words that can actually break the curses that the enemy tried to place in the lives of other people. And I, I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you. Because words that we have spoken are, you know, it's hard to sometimes filter. But I can tell you, with the Holy Spirit, it can be done. And like me, who is a person who's quiet, who would rather sit on a, on a chair and just listen to people, if God can use me with words, He can use you as well. Amen? Amen. Let's hope our heads. Before we sing, we're going to sing one more worship song. But every end of the service, we want to pray for people. I want you to ask, you know, just, just bow your heads, close your eyes. And, and I, this is not a time to manipulate you, but this is a time to give you a moment to ask the Lord. Lord, Holy Spirit, what, what are you saying to me? Now, I found out many times when I preach a message, Holy Spirit doesn't speak sometimes today. He can speak tonight. Or he can even speak tomorrow. Or maybe during the rest of the week. No, I remember that word. And so ask the Lord in the spirit right now. Lord, what are you saying to me? And please listen to the Holy Spirit. Take a moment to ask him. And then after that, we're going to be praying for people. If you need prayer, whatever, whatever it is. You need prayer for relationship. You need prayer for finances. You need prayer for you know, any decision you have to make. You know, we agree together in prayer. And every one of us needs prayer. I need prayer. And so don't think that, oh, I'm, I don't belong to Jesus' flock. I don't, need, I don't need to come forward. I don't need prayer. No, please don't do that. Don't be embarrassed if you're not even part of Jesus' flock. But if you need prayer, this is an opportunity. I want you to listen carefully. You know, I have an anointing for the altar. I always felt my anointing is in the altar calls. And every time... I've seen people healed at the altar. I've seen people restored in the altar. I've seen people, you know, refreshed in the altar. I've seen people, you know, really touched by the Lord in the altar. So I can tell you this. If you need prayer, don't hesitate. Come forward. One of our ministry team will come before you. One of our staff will come lay hands. Now, I'm going to ask those that we have called to be part of the ministry team, the altar ministry team, do not hesitate. If somebody's in front, coming in front, please come forward and pray for them. They need the touch from the Lord. And they need prayers. Okay? So we're going to sing a song first. After
after that, I'm going to ask people to stand at a certain point. And when I ask people to stand, come forward and come for prayer.